Welcome to the Confused Caucus Podcast. We are your host. My name is Munir McJohnny. My name is Joyelle Nicole Johnson. My name is David Perdue. And if you have ever been confused about politics as we are, you are in the right place. We have come together to try to demystify and combat the confusion in politics with comedy. So welcome to our first episode. I'm so glad that we have finally come together after a whole month of, of talking back and forth. You said a whole yeah. month, like a month. <laughs> the time don't matter anymore. Are you kidding me? After 2020, there's no such thing as time. I haven't <laughs> had a watch on literally all, all last year. I don't think I wore a watch. <laughs> I don't wear watches anyway. It's, yeah. it's a coat. But see, the thing with COVID months is like somehow they seem slow and super fast all at the same at time. At the same time. Same time. Which is like just, 2020 yeah. was a week and 10 years. Oh. In my mind, I'm still in 2020. Yeah, for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like this don't, we don't get a new year until we finish with the old one. If we can't, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not bringing this into this brand new one. So I'm in my mind, I'm still 2020. If I was writing checks, I would put 2020. Yeah. If I was like old and wrote checks, I would put 2020. (laughs) For whoever still writes checks. you were writing checks, I was like, are you old enough to have written a check? I'm that generation that still had to learn how to do that. But then they was like, you don't need it. (laughs) <laughs> Why was it wasting yeah. weeks? We learned so much of things that now your phone can just do, but then yeah. at the same time, we don't learn important stuff like politics that impact our everyday life, which our phones still can't do. This yeah. is facts. I want to ask y'all, why do you think we don't know about politics? In, in, like, in, like, why weren't we? I know why I wasn't taught this because I went to a conservative Christian high school and they didn't want us to know anything, but Jesus was coming back. And girls should wear pencil skirts. That's all they wanted us to know. That's all you learned. That's all they wanted us to know. I like it. So I know why I don't know, but I'm I'm curious why other people like I know why I messed up. I'm curious about people who had real education, how they came to figure out that uh, you know politics were important, or why they didn't learn it in school like that. Maybe you did. I don't know. I'm curious. I just love that you know what a pencil skirt is, and you are a straight black man. That's Listen, fantastic. Girls had to wear culottes in my high school. Do you know what a culotte is? No, nope. don't, don't you disrespect. How dare you? Okay. No, I, I, I just this was this was me saying you're too cool to know what a cool lot is. No, like, no, no, no. It's like me and other grandmothers. No, cool yeah, no. <laughs> yes, I'm old enough to know what a cool lot. I'm also old enough to have worn cool lots. Shout out to the cool lot crew. Oh, wow. crew. <laughs> but yeah, I'm curious because I know why I'm not in the know, you know, why are it, you? Yeah. I think it, I think the funny thing for me was figuring out that I wasn't in the know, right? So it's like the whole concept of like, you don't know what you don't know. Um, I was at dinner with now Representative Renita Shannon, who she's a good friend of mine. We did some activist stuff together and we were having dinner and she's like, so I'm thinking about running for Georgia House. And I was like, oh, you're moving to DC? And she's like, no, no, no. Like I'm running for the Georgia representative slot. Yeah. And I was like, right. So you're going to represent Georgia in dc and she was like you know that we have our own senate and house and like house representatives in georgia right and and i went to a really good high school i went to a really good college and i was like are you messing with me like is this for reals you're not moving to dc i was so confused and so like ashamed i went home called on my friends and i was like yo y'all know we got a senate and house in georgia and like half my friends didn't know and they're all like respectful you know educated people for all intents and purposes and I think at that moment, I realized that this is done on purpose. Like it is, it is not a happenstance that people without a lot of power don't know about politics. Like, I think it is a like well-executed plan of just a lack of information and then nothing to do about it because it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't impact those who know that we don't know. Yeah. I also think the irony of school is that we don't really learn the valuable things. You know, it's like, we don't learn how to do our taxes. Why wouldn't that be a course in high school? How, how is tax prep not a course in high school? It wasn't until I started teaching a couple of years ago and I was the gym teacher for the school, but I had to teach a class and I had to teach life skills and part of life skills was learning how to open a bank account and taxes. And I was like, why didn't I have this? Yeah. Yeah. So I think politics is a life skill, knowing your state. I mean, we had government class, but I felt like we didn't get that deep in it. It was like, we learned all of the presidents. That was like a whole year 
of U.S. government. Learn all of the presidents. FDR, New Deal. FDR, New Deal. Martin Luther King. Like that's all. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's What's, weird to me that we don't get taught that. I'm gonna start a precedent here because I feel like there's an is an easy thing to do when you're around very smart people is to smile and nod as if you know what's going on. But because I understand <laughs> the goal of this podcast, I refuse to do that. I'm gonna be vulnerable and be like, as soon as you started yes. breaking down that there were state representatives and senators, I said, "Yo, that's for real." Like I had to Google on the side because I know I I got yeah. friends who are these people, but I I also assumed they worked to DC. And then I'm like, oh, no, that's crazy. Like, we have our own, which is, you know, again, something that I'm not, I have to be refreshed on. Not to say I, did, I right, wasn't right. aware, but it is also like, oh, yeah. And then I'm like, I don't know who these people are in my life at all. And they work really hard to get that job. Or sometimes yeah. they don't. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm just trying to be transparent with the people listening, let you know that I am not the person who knows what's going on. Well, also, like mentally, we often think about like to run for a state, you know, position, you've got to be like a Harvard graduate who's got a million bucks. And that's not the reality, right? Like you said, like, we've got friends who are good people, but like, aren't filthy rich, aren't Harvard, you know, educated and are running the house and are running the state Senate, and are making laws that impact our lives every single day. Like if you are a like resident of a state in the United States, what happens in your state assembly? which has just started. So it started on January 11th in Georgia, it goes on for 40 days over the span of about three and a half months. So in Georgia, this for the 2021 session, it starts on the second Monday of January, January 11th goes to April 2nd, and it's 40 days spanned across 12 weeks. And those 40 days impact our lives for years to come. But it's all so complicated. And there's so many barriers and not just like the like, you know, whereas thereof and like that old school language, which I don't know why we still use, but just accessibility is so ridiculous. And that's, I think, part of the reason that we have the podcast, right, is to invite these people in and help break it down and say, like, tell us what it is that you actually do, because I don't even know. And, I, and I've, I've hosted dozens of these people and hosted meet and greets and had like conversations with them. And I have like high level conversations. But when it comes down to nitty gritty, I'm not really sure how that translates into any sort of action or purpose on their end. Yes. I mean, you got to learn about all the things that the people do, like comp trollers and yeah. things like that. <laughs> what are these people? What decisions do you make? You know, it's very interesting to me now because I'm older, but I think when I was young, I didn't have a desire to know about a state assembly and what was happening. I think, so you bring up an interesting point. I was trying to figure out, is it because we're older that we know this stuff or is it because the time has changed, right? And and especially for like, you know, black indigenous people of color, I moved here when I was two years old from Pakistan and India. My parents were focused on food, water, shelter, right? Like yes. basic needs. We're not worried about anything else. We don't even have capacity to think about that stuff. And I think there's a lot of things that go on at the same time. So I think one, and I'm speaking for like the South Asian community who's been here for a really long time, right? Like we finally established ourselves. We have our food, water, shelter set. And so we're able to, as like the second generation, and I'm still not born here, to focus on these other things that impact our lives that we weren't able to beforehand. But at the same time, I think the younger generation are doing it right now. Like there was a high schooler who blew up on social media for like really calling out his school uh board in Gwinnett County because they were on some like they were on some stupid shit and he blew up and so like we're seeing the youth get involved at the same time and so I'm curious as to your opinions about like is it the time is it that we're older or is it as people who are like you know we've got two black and a brown person on this show that like we're starting to finally see our people get more involved I well as far as the kids go blew up is an interesting phrase because they getting shot up so if y'all, if we weren't getting shot up when I was in school, so I feel like right, if right. I had to worry about the second amendment and they keep blasting the second amendment, maybe me and a couple of friends might figure out what's going on with the second amendment. Yeah. And these kids are able to be on TikTok and Twitter and everything right now. So it's like Twitter, all you got to do is click on a tab and then you'll have the trending topics. Yeah. So I think also Trump. 
Right. Yeah. We all had yeah. to get involved in politics. Yeah. I just remember somebody tweeting like, I just want to get back to not knowing who the secretary of education is. <laughs> like, why do I not only know who the secretary of education is, but hate that bitch? Why do I hate? Yeah. It? Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to it. So I think Trump also forced all of our hands to yeah. learn politics and how we can change this. We all, we all forced up our game. I definitely think like you were saying, like the youth, uh, I mean, like I, I always tell people, I'm in that weird generation where we had to learn a bunch of stuff that is obsolete. Like I remember mm-hmm. having typing class for, yes. what? you know what I'm saying? So I feel like, uh, first we, of all, that is not a good example because we have to <laughs> type on laptops. All of the time. No, no, no. I'm talking about with a typewriter. Yes. <laughs> oh, like I had to learn how to put the paper back in, back in. And and I was like third. You know what I'm saying? That is not necessary anymore. What I was saying is like they have access to so much more information, yeah. whereas we had to like get an encyclopedia. So imagine how much more I could have known if I'd have to go through collections and encyclopedias to figure out anything that they can click get with the you know the click of a finger. So you know the the speed and immediacy of information is gonna propel people to be a little bit more engaged, a little bit more understanding. And like I'm I'm very jealous of uh, my younger cousins. I don't necessarily love their uh, what they like musically. But they'll rap the worst lyrics in the world, but then tell me way more about what's going on around them than I ever knew at their age. So I'm like, I guess it's a fair trade. Like, I don't have yeah. to like your rappers, but I appreciate that you know a lot more than I ever did at your age about politics and everything going on. Yeah, so, I, it, I also think to piggyback on that, I was uh, disenfranchised my first time out the gate voting. My first mm. election was um, Bush v. Gore. Mm. Oh, and- yeah. That was my first, like, I was whatever, 19. I was like, I'm voting for the president. And then when that outcome happened, I just kind of was like, F this. You know, it made it, made it seem like my vote didn't matter. Right. It made it seem like all the, the time that our ancestors took getting hosed down didn't matter because they were able to, re- to reverse the decision of the people. So it's not yeah. till now that I'm like, oh, our votes do matter, especially yeah. Georgia. Georgia made me realize our votes yep. matter so much. For sure. And, uh, and something that's really interesting that's going to happen over the next decade, and, and if you haven't looked into this, it's, it's you can Google the great wealth transfer. So they're saying over the next decade, there is going to be 30 trillion, that's T, trillion dollars in wealth and power transferred from the baby boomers to like the younger generations. Right. And, and, you know, that's a lot of power and wealth. And we see that in Georgia alone, where I'm sure someone can pull the data on this. But if you look at our state house and our state Senate, not so much the Senate, but the state house or Atlanta city council, the average age has dropped by decades over just these last few cycles. Asaf is the youngest Senator to go. What is he? 32, 33, 33. Yeah. 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 That's so disheartening. It's wild. (laughs) I don't, wow. I don't like that at all. <laughs> I didn't realize the that. second time he ran. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I was like, who? He was ambitious two years ago when he was like just hitting 30. You know what I was doing? I just hit 30. I'm 33. You know what I was doing? Not thinking about being a senator. Yep. I know that much. I didn't have any of those ambitions. So I'm, you know, kudos to him. But also now I have a lot of explaining to do to people in my life. And I don't like that. <laughs> I, I am him as a person. <laughs> I'm like, not on the Asif barometer. That's a different, <laughs> that's that's that Obama barometer. He want to be president before he's 50. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need all that stress. <laughs> it looks real stressful. It looks very stressful. You can't imagine. <laughs> Your hair yeah. brain. <laughs> and but but that's gonna continue to happen, right? Like I and I think that's for the most part a good thing. But the interesting thing will be now this generation is going to become their grandparents' generation, right? Where it skips. And then it's like, now we will be in the political realm until we're like 80. And so I'll be curious to see if we learn from our mistakes of the prior generations and like at some point put in limitations. Because yes. we've got representatives in our state house in Georgia who've been there for 30, 40 years and say it proudly, right? Like I've been here for 40 years and I'm like that, I don't know if that's what I want. Like you will get lazy and tired and stop like connecting with your representatives, right? And then if you look at on the other side, people like Park Cannon and Sam Park and Renita and Amir Faruqi, and they do like weekly emails and like, you know, monthly, like here's what we've been working on and are really open 
to sharing that information and don't hold information as power. Like AOC that are live to talk about what happened at the Capitol. I don't know any other individual there who's done that, right? And I think the access of power and the power of access both go hand in hand so much. And that's been kept from our generation for so long that like purposely we don't know so many of these things. Yeah, well, we know who was doing lives at the insurrection. It was the insurrectionists. Yes. <laughs> Those brilliant human beings who yeah. don't know that when you delete a live, oh, the God, FBI yeah. still has access to that. <laughs> there, yeah. I just saw a news article where girls who are democratic or liberal are changing their um, handles on like all the dating apps and putting preferences conservatives. Yeah. And all these guys are there literally promoting the fact that they're there and they're screenshotting it and sending it to the FBI. Yes, I saw that. that, that, that I was like, that, that is brilliant. That is brilliant strategy. I am here for it. What I, I also so think I'm excited about our young people because they're create, developing strategies like that. You know, like when yes. the TikTokers took yeah. over Trump's uh, rally and yeah. ordered all these tickets or, or they're filling their carts with his merchandise and making that interrupt him. You know, they're, they're being more creative because they're more Brilliant. savvy with technology now. So yeah. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. He was yeah. just yelling at people. What? <laughs> that's it. Our generation was just yelling at people. <laughs> oh, I be yelling at people in the streets. <laughs> yeah, and that's necessary. Yelling at people is yes. necessary. But these TikTok teens, as I like to call them, they be out here strategizing. I never had that foresight. TikTok teens. TikTok teens I like that. I like it. Them. I don't have that, you know. But yeah, yeah. That, that that is one of the things I definitely was, uh, I, I found hilarious was the people at the insurrection recording themselves during the thing. I was like, oh, like it, it was a unifying moment because I was like, oh, this is just like when rappers be rapping about the stuff they do and then get surprised when the police pulled up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, everybody got these type of people. Everybody, like, everybody got the type. You don't gotta be black to be a nigga. That's that fact. A whole bunch of niggas that. <laughs> yeah, you go to that Walmart right up on that capital. <laughs> you go to any any suburban Walmart and figure that out quick. There you Hello. go. <laughs> Especially down here. Yeah, and they. I mean, like these youth have put together. You know, Ossoff at a whole students for Ossoff or students for Warnock, and they put together some really powerful stuff on TikTok that like made movements. And, you know, yeah. they've, they've done the student marches and stuff. And it's really phenomenal to see that generation. Like I call, there's an there's a, a activist in Atlanta. I think he just started his freshman year or sophomore year in, at Emory, Royce Mann, right? He's a sophomore. I'm probably 15 years older than him. And I call him for advice. I'm like, yo, what's, what's going on with this bill? What, what are, what are y'all doing? What's the right way to vote on that? You know, mm. cause they are so in tune to this stuff that I love it. But I'm also like, David, I'm like, Oh, we got, we got a lot of catching up to do with our generation here. Yeah. Yes. And I do think I often remind myself, like, cause I think that like when I see what I call, like I call the TikTok teens and all they're doing, I'm reminded that like, even in, you know, I'm 33, I'll be 34 soon. Right. And I'm thinking of like, I ain't, I'm not, I, clearly I'm not like late. Like I'm not, I haven't missed it. You know what I mean? And I'm always reminded of the fact that like the people, some of my my biggest heroes in life who I think changed the world never hit 40. You know, like Malcolm X never hit 40. Martin Luther King, they never hit 40. And I'll think about all the work that they did leading up to, you know, their ultimate demise, you know, their, their, their assassination. And right. I'm just like, oh, okay, there's like, young people have been historically getting things done. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and oh. so it's like, it's, you know what I mean? Like, there's, I got time to do something. Yeah. You have time to do something, but also the opposite end of that is Harvey Milk was 50 Facts. before he did what he did. Leslie Jones was 50 when she got SNL, you know? So right. it's like, I, I compare life a lot to tortoises and hares and how slow and steady can still win the race and it mm, will nice. win the race. You know, there are people that are going to be a Kobe Bryant or a Martin Luther King because they do not have this much time on earth. And then there'll mm. be other people that be like, you know what? I'm almost 40. Now I can start really getting involved in politics. Yeah. You know, it's never too late. So Joyo, you are fairly involved though, right? You sit on a pack board. How did you kind of come into this space? I came into the space. I came into comedy politically. George Carlin is my hero. When I was a kid, I would watch Carlin on HBO and I developed a new sensibility. I mm. stopped wanting to go to Sunday school. I started questioning politicians and I learned from him and I learned that comedy also can change people's minds. So that's how I fell in love with comedy, but I was just scared of it. I was like, oh, I don't think I can do that because I'm scared. So when I finally got into it, 
and I met um, a woman named Liz Winstead. She's one of the co-creators of The Daily Show. She started an abortion activism group. And I immediately joined it because I was like, I, if I can do politics and comedy, yeah. that's going to be, you know, the marriage to me that's perfect. So that's when I got my start uh, with the Lady Parts Justice that is now the Abortion Access Front traveling around the country, learning about trap laws, which are the laws that are instituted in the state and local governments mm. that are preventing women from having abortions. And so that made me realize how important our local elections are and our state representatives, representatives and the like. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's so interesting that you bring up like, you know, The Daily Show and Colbert and Stewart in college, that's how I got my news. And that's how yeah. most of our friends got our news, Completely. right? We didn't want to sit and watch like any, you know, major thing. We're like, we need this to be funny because it's devastating and difficult. And, and I think that's, you know, I jokingly always tell people that I stalk David. And, and I think like mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I love his comedy is because it's that observational comedy, right? Of like, there's some really fucked up things going on in our world. <laughs> And we could go down that path or we could joke about it, but then also still understand what's going on and get educated, right? And I think yeah. so many of my friends wouldn't watch the news unless it was Colbert or Stewart packing mm -hmm. it, packaging it in fun comedy bits, right? Um, so David, I know like, you know, you and I did comedy and conversations and part of, funny enough, part of what we were originally going to call this po podcast was politics and comedians and do some sort of thing of like sometimes politicians, you know, tell the jokes and comedians spit the truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have, you know, although I know you say that you don't know all the terms and logistics of it, you've also been mm -hmm. involved some way or somehow in the outskirts of this. What was it that kind of drove you into this more? Uh, kind of like what I said in the beginning, like I, I went to what is considered very conservative Christian school, like kindergarten through high school graduation. And so being like the only a lot of times the only black kid in there i just remember being like something fit understanding very early that like something is different about what you guys are hearing and what i'm hearing about how we talk about everything and i would get debriefed by my parents about what was going on mm -hmm. so i so i was like okay i'm getting i'm here for the education but also like these people once they graduate they go off and do very different things they think very differently and so i, I never considered myself political but i was always going to very curious as to how people arrived at certain ideologies and things like that. And I, I, for the life of me, I just really could not understand how we would hear this, hear certain things and come to very different conclusions. And while one was, I, was, I, I felt like I was based in a very curiosity, like what's going on. And there, a lot of the people that I grew up with was kind of based on like a, this is what they told me. We're going to ride with right, this. Right, like, right. Hey, I don't know if y'all know this, people be wrong. People be lying. People be lying, <laughs> like real wrong, you know? And so it, it kind of, it, comedically, it kind of made me say, like, we have to ask, I have to be that annoying kid that asks a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have to try to hold spaces for the difficult things and try to figure, and then also going to Morehouse and they put this whole thing in here, you got to be somebody. So I spent a lot of money for people like, you know, you got to be somebody. <laughs> so that also caused me to say, let me pay attention to what's going on and be as the motto was when I was there, a renaissance man with social conscience. And so I tried to like incorporate that into mm. humor because I did realize that like, I might not be political, but I do understand that uh, art is a reflection of culture and culture moves politics. You know what I mean? Like culture is, is so I might not be able to, to write a bill or understand it all or whatever, but if I can maybe shine light or, 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 or start a conversation, which I do, I get conversations with people after shows so many times. I'm like, I don't, I, can I, can you just say I'm funny and leave me alone? Like, I don't want to talk about you, what you, what you got from my set. <laughs> this ain't a Ted talk. I don't you know? miss that at all. I don't miss that at all. Uh, but it still happens online shows. That's for another day. It still happens. And that's not fun. But anyway, I just, I really, at the core of what I try to do is really just say, why is this this? Mm -hmm. And is it the best for everybody? And if it's not like our people who aren't being heard being hurt, and why aren't they? Or what what are we doing that is harming ourselves? And how do we stop it? Let's question it all because people are people are dying, people are being injured, people are being broken. Like we're in, you know, systems are, are 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 hardening, some are loosening, some are hardening, and they're making life difficult for people. And it doesn't have to be this way if we just simply examine what's going on in the world around us a little more critically and stop buying into these ideas that are just 
spoon fed to you so that you can maintain some idea of safety and sanity. It's like, no, no, no. Sometimes you got to break down, break down things to, to like progress. You know, the great Frederick Douglass quote, without struggle, there's no progress. It's like, sometimes we got to struggle with ideas mm. so we can get to places that we ain't been yet. So that's like, I like to sit up here and poke at stuff. Like, that's really all it is. I like to poke at stuff to, to hopefully gain some light. And I gain some myself. I don't necessarily believe everything I say all the time, but if it gets the conversation going, then let's, you know what I mean? Let's make it happen. So that's kind of how I arrived at, you know, I guess what you call it, being somewhat active. Yeah. I think your, your sensation for curiosity. And then I think both of us, you know, we talked a lot about in the comedy and conversations event that we did of like this black Brown coalition as well. Right. And I think that also takes a level of comfortability being uncomfortable. And I think too often the one downside of all of our social media stuff is we're so behind our phones that we're not okay being uncomfortable, right? Because if something makes us uncomfortable, it's a swipe or an up, and then you're on to your next thing. Mm. And I think politics takes a lot of that as well as just coalition building and activism of just being comfortable, not being comfortable and not knowing and being okay asking the curious questions. Um, that also leads into our you know original when we were thinking about this of like the socratic paradox of like i know that i know nothing right and and it's a paradox because to know that you know nothing you have to know that there's something else out there but it's also been made true in our world today where we know that there's a lot of power you know at the gold dome where where our legislation is being made and a lot of power in dc and we're being barricaded outside right like you've got you know it's so hard now that the three of us know that legislation is happening. There's 40 days of all these laws that are gonna be passed. We probably still couldn't figure out what goes on. Like it would still be super complicated for us to know, okay, there's some bill called HBXYZ, but like, what does that really mean? And what is the impact of it, right? And, and this kind of leads to like this thing that I've talked about a lot of like the Republican party will call something religious freedom. And you're like, oh, that sounds something that I would be for. Like I, I would vote for religious freedom. And then you find out that it's a way to like legitimize not serving LGBTQ people when they come into your business. And you're like, oh shit, what? Like that was so deep and so barred in that even if I had that bill in my hand, I would probably walk away saying, oh, this is a great bill. Why would anyone not vote for it? And yes. so there is this like, there is this purposeful lack of trans, you know, transparency and understanding there as well. Yeah, because if we actually understand, we will want to storm the Capitol yeah. for all the stuff that they do because they put abortion restrictions mitch mcconnell tried to put abortion restrictions in the stimulus bill yep <laughs> wow <laughs> like they hide it they hide it in the language and it's and it's meant to confuse us and it's meant to make us be like you know what i don't want to be involved yeah, yeah. I what, I, what, what i'm gathering from what everybody's saying just now is that if we do as a podcast kind of what our if we hit our goals people will be upset with us is that <laughs> <laughs> is that yeah, what I'm gathering? There will be people like, no, no, no. Why are you blowing up a spot? Why are you giving away game? Why are you asking these questions? Like, you know, people will be upset and that's okay. It's yep. my goal every day to make white people mad. And oh, yeah. if there this you podcast go. does that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, Top they're, goals. They're just mad that we have the right to vote. So going back to what we we're talking about before about state legislators, do you guys know about the original 33? <clears throat> The original 33, no. David, like, Mr. Morehouse. Uh, I didn't pay attention to all yeah. the questions. <laughs> it was, it was. In 1868, after the um, Civil War, the Freedman's Bureau came down to Georgia and they educated Negroes about their right to vote. And we elected 30 state reps and three state senators that were black in mm -hmm. 1868. And the white people got so mad they started, they first of all ejected them from the house. Like they ejected them and then just started murdering black people to stop them from voting. And then, you know, Jim Crow and everything passed after that. But we had this, especially in Georgia. We yeah. had a situation in 1868 where we had power and they, they realized, oh, we don't want them to vote. Right. We don't want black and brown people. And another thing about immigration, all the immigrants that came from Georgia, came into Atlanta mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. So between the reverse great migration and immigrants, that's how we turned Georgia blue. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And 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 you know for like on that note, there is even 
I don't remember what year this is, but even recent stuff where I saw pictures of like, you know, uh, Julian Bond sitting there with like all of his white representatives literally standing up to vote him out, not letting him swear in. Right. And so it happened decades ago, but then also very recently. Right. There's all of these things that continues to happen. And I think for for immigrants, we've had this mentality for such a long time that like politics is corrupt back home. Right. Like India, Pakistan. (laughs) Politics is corrupt as shit. In every and brown country. And Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. And now we're looking back and I'm getting texts from family. And you've got like some Pakistani ambassador the other day texted like his thoughts and prayers for what's going on at the Capitol in the United States, right? And there were like, we were turning on the TV and my parents were like, this is like what would happen back home. Like what yeah. is going on, right? Yeah. Like Modi texted yeah, right, his, right, like, Modi, right. dude, you're- Yeah, and you're like, <laughs> what? You know, and the Carter Center is turning around and saying, we need to look at elections here. Like we're done with like Indonesia and all these other places. We got to do work here. Like Doctors Without Borders coming back to the United States. Imagine that, the that's how far, right. In four years, that's how far back we went. In yes. just four years, right? And I think what's going to be important and and one of the goals for the podcast is to continue this momentum because there are so many people who are like, oh, Biden's elected. I don't have to worry about it. Right. And yeah, and and that's not the truth. We learned. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Right. Right. And and Andrew Yang tweeted out a a couple of days ago, um, and I don't remember the exact tweet, but it was, you know, I can't wait till Trump is out. So we (laughs) realized that he isn't the problem. He yeah, was yeah. a problem, but he was like not the problem. There's problems in the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party, and Libertarian. For like there's, sure. they're all over the place, I mean, and and we've got to hold ourselves accountable for that. Completely. I mean, everybody bringing up stuff like I don't want Kamala because she was a she put black men in jail. She was a prosecutor. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, but she was a prosecutor. Shut right. up. Okay. <laughs> Biden crime bill that was 800 years ago. Look. If it ain't Trump, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it. yeah. But also, even with that, my my biggest thing when I my take when I hear stuff like that, and I be like, every like I want politicians to change with the culture. Yes. Like I don't want you to still be where you were right. in ninety right. whatever. Yes. Like oh, if but- we say, hey, we don't like you was doing that. You like y'all don't like that. Well, since I work for y'all, let me not do that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, yes. That's what you want from your politicians. So when people are like, I don't like that you said this one time. Well, why don't you like that they switched it up? Yep. Ask yep, yourself yep. why you don't like that way switch and listen to us. Yes. You know, uh, yeah. Like hold Obama. them accountable, but hold, you know what I mean? But like they listen, that's their job is to switch it up. Mm-hmm. Like their job yep. is to switch it up, you know? Yeah. And all the arguments about Hillary um having all of her hiccups, that's like she's a life, she's a career politician. You're gonna yeah. have issues as a career politician. You've been in this game for all this time. Yes, there's gonna be something we can target in your past that you messed up on, you know. Right, yeah. 100%. I don't need you perfect. I just need you honest. This can be I honest. definitely don't need you perfect. I don't yeah. trust you perfect. I don't, I don't trust, trust you perfect. anybody who pretends to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of the other things that happens, and no matter what party side you're on, they rely on us being sold on our party so much because we can't learn to have conversations across the aisle. Like I would go to the office and, and uh, you know, I won't, a lot of my friends are hardcore Republicans. Right. And I'll have I'll try to have conversations with them. But if they told me that Obama did something wrong, I'd be like, hell no, he was perfect. Like he didn't do nothing wrong because I don't want to admit that to them. I'll right. talk about it with my Democratic friends. Right. When we're like, I'm like, man, this dude's not doing some shit like he's, he's out here bomb, you know, but we won't have that accountability with our Republican friends and vice versa. Right. As a result, if I ever attack Trump, he'd be like, no, no, no. Here's his excuse. And what I realized is that when I really opened up and actually start, started to have a conversation and I said, you know, I wish Obama did this differently. They became more open to say, yeah, man, I wish Trump wasn't doing this stupid shit either, right? And I think we've got to have conversations across party lines with people who are not like, you know, jumping into the Capitol, because those are, I think, too far beyond. Far gone. <laughs> but we've got to start having these conversations so we can hold our elected officials accountable, no matter what side of the aisle they're on. Because otherwise we become too protective of our own and that only ends up hurting us as the public in the end. Yeah, can we back up for two seconds so you're friends with Trump supporters? <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah, no, record. not Trump supporters. Not Republicans, Republicans who who Republicans. who who say that they're not Trump supporters. So like Lincoln Project type people okay. who are who are worth having conversations with. What I've realized is 
we've got to have conversations across the aisle, but there's a limit to who you can have conversations with. Right. I'm yeah. not anyone who voted for Trump twice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's just nothing. Yeah, I agree. I, totally I agree. Maybe talk to you if you voted for him the first time, yeah. but barely, but yeah. twice. Yeah. This yeah. after this last one? Yeah. Nah. There's yeah. No. yeah. There's, there's cutoff limits. And I think, but I think to that point, with those who we are able to have conversations with, I think it's important that we have those conversations. You know what I mean? Like there's gotta be a way, just like for politicians when we're like, you changed your mind and came over like on whatever topic, like we've got to allow, and I don't know how we do this appropriately because I want everybody who voted to, for Trump to get like some sort of like headgear or something that's permanently on there. I'm like, y'all oh. came out of the woodworks. Like I need to know, like, this is who you are. You know, like you can't not, just like go back. In- Inglorious Bastards, did you guys yeah, see? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I want the Nazi, yeah. I want the MAGA on your forehead. This is who you are, you know? But then we've also got to allow for a culture that allows people to apologize and understand and come back and like fold them back into society, right? Because otherwise, where do we go? Like how bifurcated do we continue to be where there are just two Americas, right? Like where, where does that lead us? You just gonna casually drop bifurcated? All right. Yeah. This is where we at. Come on, man. I see it. I yeah. ain't even gonna Google it. I'm gonna just the say we bifurcated. You bifurcated. I knew Americans. it was two something, but what is the bifurcated part? <laughs> two? Two or what? And I feel two. like opposing directions, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but we bifurcated. That's why I followed it up with two Americas. Yeah, I saw yeah. that look on your face. <laughs> You know, but yeah, we end up with two Americas, right? We end up with people who literally, even after a democratic process where you've got a Republican telling you this was a legitimate process, Mm -hmm. are still not buying it. How how do you reconcile that? What is the reconciliation of that looks like? There's always been more than one America. There's always been a reality of America that exists for straight white men that does not exist for anyone else. And as a black female, I have to live in the reality of a colored America Mm -hmm. and a gendered America, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I I don't even know why people think we're gonna have one America. That's not happening. Yeah, Yeah. so I I think you bring up (laughs) a good point. I think there is a delusion of one America where, so I live in Fayetteville. And when we first moved here, I moved here from Riverdale, Georgia, lived in Riverdale, 98% black population, moved to Fayetteville because my high school lost its accreditation. And my parents moved across the world for me to get a good education. And they're like, great. We ended up in the worst (laughs) education system in the entire country, losing its accreditation after 35 years in any other in any other uh, county. Right. It also produced me. I just want to put that out. See, there you go. Um, (laughs) Produced what? Me. I'm a product of this education. uh, Yeah. (laughs) And so we moved to Fayetteville. We were the second brown family in our in our um, in our entire neighborhood. Uh, one black family, us, and our house would get egged every weekend. Our tree would get, you know. Ooh. And then on the bus, like I literally had nightmares because I was bullied so much, right? Mm-hmm. And there was that, and then there is the now, right? Where I'm like, I was bullied, and then I became comfortable. I ended up dating a white girl in high school and we would walk around like just stupid stuff like walking around Walmart and I would see the looks that we would get right that she didn't pick up on but even then I was never like scared for my life right I was like some shit could go down but I wasn't like scared for my life now especially post 9-11 South Asians people my color and I'm Muslim we realized how quickly the model minority myth was a myth right the model minority myth is is where South Asians came to America, but because we were respectful and quiet and what the like white man needed as the new servant, and we're going to work the gas stations, we're going to drive the taxis, and we're going to do it quietly. We got so many opportunities that we were able to outpace a lot of black Americans. And then we looked back and said, y'all been here forever. We're new. How come y'all aren't doing what we're doing? Right. And we forgot that a whole model minority myth was created where not only were we told by white people that we are better than the black community, right? We were also told that Black people are less than our community, right? And that got built into so many South Asian people that we forget that the only reason we have a goddamn right to be in the United States and to vote is because Black people literally lost their lives for, for us to do that. You're right. right. We, we forget, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and yeah. we forget the gratitude. And it took me years to understand that. It wasn't until maybe like two or three years ago that I was like, shit, the only reason that I can vote is because black people can vote. And we forget that. 
Mm -hmm. right? And it took us a really long time. And we're still getting over that and still understanding that and explaining that to like our parents and our grandparents of like, there is all these things that happen. And then 9-11 happened and boom, that model minority myth went away. I was yeah. happy. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't happy about 9-11. I was not happy about yeah. 9-11, <laughs> but I was happy that the model minority myth went away because of the fact that it was, it's a falsehood and it's, yeah. and it's created so that we don't join together. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same yep. thing with the poor man's march. They were fine with Martin Luther King until he started joining poor people that together. Poor That's when they were like, yeah. we got to kill this nigga. Yeah, this, yeah. this ain't going to work. This yeah. ain't going to work. <laughs> poor white work. people can't know that yeah. we hate them too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, and we forget that the amount of power that we have, if we join forces, which you really saw you know, in this election cycle, right? You saw like Black Votes Matter and the Asian American Advocacy Fund. All of these people were doing such great work that like you felt for the first time I felt when I went to a rally, I was like, here we are, right? And, and ironically enough, right? You've got Kamala Harris, who is both black and brown. And so both mm -hmm. of us are like, that's our peoples. That's our peoples. And like, what a beautiful representation of black brown coalitions, right? That's now gonna be stepping into the White House for the first also time. Also female and the also, female part is yeah. what's so important to me because I had a comedian who was one of my uh, idols who will remain nameless, but he asked me what is more hated my race and my gender in this country. Mm. And I told him, I was like, you would think it's America, it's, it's race. But women are second class citizens of the world. Yeah. And I don't care what anyone tells me. Hillary lost because she's a woman. I don't care 100%. what anyone tells me. The race was this close because mm -hmm. he chose Kamala. Mm -hmm. If he chose another white man, if he chose Bernie or someone else, it would have been a landslide. But the mm -hmm. fact yep. that he chose a female as his yeah. running mate made all them things vote yeah. <laughs> even more 100%. white yeah. women. That's how time. I know he won. Because you got a black woman <laughs> and you still want an America. All them votes had to, everybody had to show for that. Yep. That's Everyone had to show up. And yeah. that and that's why it's like that that rift right now and having a woman, like it makes me cry to think about. And um, Sonia Sotomayor is, is yeah, yeah. swearing her in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. die, choke mad, choke and die yeah. mad because y'all yeah. don't want women running this country because we need to. Man, y'all have had your chance. Listen, Move over. people laughed at me. I was on a, a podcast a few years ago, a friend of mine's podcast, and it was election season, and they were talking about voting. And everybody laughed at me, and they were like, how are you voting? I said, honestly, like, yes, I'm going to be more informed. But a lot of times, like now, I just be like, yo, where are the women? Because we tried, and it ain't working. Like, give somebody else a chance. We didn't did it. And look where yeah. we at. So I was like, I don't know. I just want y'all to give women a chance to mess up. I doubt yeah. it's going to happen at the same rate. But here I am. I'm like, I, I can't do it no more. Like, if this is what men have produced, then we got to switch it up. Mm -hmm. We got to switch it up. We got to switch it up. Countries that had good COVID responses yeah. are led by women. Yep. Facts. Yep. Facts. And and even CEOs, right? So there's, I, I was just Googling this because I'd read it a long time ago, but they say female-led companies do 20% on, on average better even in the stock market, right? But then if you look at Fortune 500, I think there's 30 something women that are on there, mm. right? And and I this is something that I actually literally factor in now when I invest in the stock market. I look at the leadership and if it's a woman leader, like I tend to be more like bullish or stronger on that because I'm like, statistically speaking, they're gonna do better, yeah. right? And a lot of people don't know that, you know what I mean? I was talking to a friend of mine who's in the stock market and asked him about Lululemon. And he literally was like, eh, I just don't know that company. And I'm like, you goddamn stock agent. Like, I don't care if they're selling women's clothing or like whatever they're doing. How do you not, you know, but that got me thinking, like, I imagine most stock people like who are investing in stocks or advisors are old white men. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I can only imagine how many of them are like, oh, Lululemon, what was that? I ain't investing in no lemon. Right. And so you think about like the injustice that happens even in stock investments, Right, which should be just a, you know, binary one zero yes no statistic number non emotional investment, even then has so much like gender inequality in it that it is ridiculous. There's nothing that's not emotional. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's the irony of people when when Hillary was running, so many people were like, women are too emotional, and there was a clip from the Daily Show where Jordan Klepper was interviewing a woman, 
And she was saying, women shouldn't run the country because they're too emotional. They'll start a war, like drop of a hat. And he goes, haven't all wars been started yep. by men? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. that the biggest shift, so I'm a psych major, if y'all couldn't already tell, the biggest shift when I transferred from high school to college and really the 21st, like the 20th century to the 21st century in psychology was from finally accepting that we're not rational beings, but we're emotional beings. We finally figured that out. Like science got deep enough to where we were like, oh, we're actually emotional beings who rationalize our decisions. But science just couldn't go deep into our brain to really find that out. And that was like the biggest shift of like, oh, we're not rational beings. Because that's what I was taught in high school. And then college psych came in and we're like, yeah, we're all emotional beings. We just rationalize the decisions that we make, right? And that's what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, there's a really interesting uh, professor that I took at Emory who actually wrote speeches for presidents. And he said, it's all emotional. You vote so emotionally, so much so that he did a research project when it was McCain versus Obama on testosterone count for men. And there was a standard deviation decrease in men who were hardcore supporters of McCain when he lost. I right. Heard, and I just heard standard for men who were hard. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't want this to, to stick. That's <laughs> how much of a difference it made, right? Emotion men were so emotional that they had a decrease in their testosterone level over time. It, it was the whole course of the conservative movement going back to Reagan and his cowboy shit and like be, you know, you're a man, we're men and yes, men yeah. need to vote for men and not these, you know, liberals these that are- boys, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah these yeah. little, what what do they want? They're gay and they want gay people to have rights. No, yeah. we're men, we got guns. Yeah, all our problems can be solved by shooting. <laughs> <laughs> like that ain't how that works. It's not how that we works We got guns. All. Yeah, it ain't how it work at all. They all yeah. need hugs. They do. That's they do need hugs. Trump need a hug. That poor that's, baby. And that's honestly like that's part of like because you were talking about earlier about like why we reach the other side, why we talk to people. And I just want to preface up saying that ain't everybody's ministry. I had to learn that early, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's job is not to do that. It if 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 it is placed on you to do that, that is your job. But if it ain't, that ain't your job, you know. But I think I do think it is important because there is. There is a level that we're never going to be one America, but there are part, there are levels of reconciliation that are very possible yeah. when given a shot. And that shot, if you, you know, talk about reconciliation by hear that word, truth has to come first, right? Yes. You cannot have the, you yes. cannot have reconciliation until you first encounter the truth, yeah. right? Yes. The actual factual truth. And so I feel like whether it's comedy art, whatever it is in these situations where we look to do that, the first thing we have to do is say, we can't go nowhere unless you're ready to face the truth. Mm -hmm. and we can't get to the truth if you're trying to avoid it the whole time. But if you want to engage with me and we can come with truth, in fact, then we, let's let's make something happen. And I, 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 like I said, I grew up conservative Christian high schools. I have friends who at one point in time, remember commenting on Facebook after the, the murder of Freddie Gray and like, look at them, Black Lives Matter burning their own neighborhood and stuff like that too. Now we're having discussions about, he's like, no, no, no. Like police system is trash. I saw the Khalif Browder story. Like this system, I had no idea. And I'm like, had I not continued to engage with this individual, yeah. <laughs> you know, in tip providing the truth, who knows? Who knows where is it? Now, do we agree on it? A lot, most things, no, 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 no. <laughs> A lot of things we do not agree on. But I know that there is hope when you when you insert the truth regularly. You know, if somebody wants to receive like, and it's not my job it's about the results. I can't care, but I can, if I'm gonna, if it's gonna be placed on my heart, I have to give it to you in yeah. hopes of reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. And again, not everybody's ministry, but somebody has to be willing to do that. No, I love my favorite thing when we would go on the abortion tours, <laughs> we'd go to clinics and escort women into the clinics mm. and they called me the protest whisperer because I would always, my strategy was to get them talking so that they weren't yelling at the girls. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, all of these men out there, usually men, yeah, <laughs> like 90% yeah. men, yeah, yeah, screaming at these women, shaming them. So I would come and just ask questions. Like, I want, I want to know like where you are with this. I mean, I, I would get deep with them and be like, are you a virgin? Like things mm -hmm. like that, where it's like these little kids, you haven't even had sex yet. Holler at me when you have an accident and right. tell me how you, <laughs> how much you, get, yeah. you are you know so it's if that and that's the thing about truth is that 
it is the great equalizer, I think, because there's going to be a certain point where there is no more truth if you keep mm-hmm. asking these people questions because mm-hmm. they can't defend their bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that I think the two things that are important here is that it's a shared truth, right? Because so many times your truth and my truth and their truth are three different truths because of our backgrounds, our history, the way that we hear words changes so much of it. And then I think probably the most powerful thing that I learned in psychology was cognitive dissonance, right? Yes. You're able to hold two opposing thoughts in your head at the same time. And like, you know, the basic example that people always give of that is like, you're at Walmart, you believe that stealing is wrong, but you're also like, eh, Walmart's a global conglomerate who abuses people and doesn't pay minimum wage. I can take X, Y, and Z and they'll be fine, right? But then you put that to the 10th level of these like Trumpers in, in these like insurrectionists throughout the Capitol who claim blue lives matter, who claim law and order, who claim right democracy yeah. and that are doing exactly the opposite. And the problem there is you can't have a conversation with them because mm-hmm. cognitive dissonance is a true belief. And you could put them up to a lie detector and they could say shit that you know is false, but they will believe it is right, mm-hmm. yeah. right? And I just want to change that slogan to be like, uh, "Blue lives or uh, all, all lives matter to you." Or "Blue lives matter to you," <laughs> yeah. like law and order for you, not for, for you. me, right? Not for me. Blue lives don't matter. They they said a cop said he was getting beat by somebody with a blue lives matter flag. Like yeah. you, you literally compartmentalization. Like they yeah. put they put their things. And I also think to even extend that, our three Supreme Court justices who are so pro life, putting all these people to death in the past couple of uh, days, in the last yeah. days of this uh, thing. But but you but you guys are pro-life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, that's what, and it goes to, like, this is why I love comedy. And then we, you talked about the truth and like three different truths, but one of my favorite comedians, favorite one of my favorite quotes, Patrice O'Neill, you can't fuck with the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't, you cannot. And so no matter how you see it, if I, if, if I give you the actual factual truth, it, the truth stands on its own. So no matter whatever you're bringing to the table, if it consists, and I always say this too, we talk about those 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 uh, Supreme Court people who are murdering people, and then also our pro uh, our pro life. It's like consistency. I always I love this quote: is "Consistency breeds credibility." Mm. If you're not consistent, you will not be credible. And there's a lot of people now who are who are uh, like I think the part of the the, the anxious people are recognizing that they're not credible. Right. So they're holding on to this this power that was based in this credibility, and they're just crumbling. You know what yeah. I mean, and so yeah. and, and so that's also a part of it. It's like, yo, you're you're getting fed a lot of the things that you know to be to be kind of weak arguments, and you're not being consistent, and that's an, an internal like a problem for a lot of people. They don't know what to do with themselves. They ab- absolutely do not know what to do for themselves. You know, I think that, and, that just yeah, yeah, and I mean, like even if you look at capital punishment, I'd be curious to see how many rich people have ever been like on the receiving end of capital punishment. Right. Right. Capital punishment really just means that you don't have the capital or the wealth, right, to not be punished. That's all it is. Right. And like what gives us the right to do that, especially when on the other end, then you preach about like anti-abortion and pro-life and all this stuff. Right. Like the, the dichotomy in their minds and the cognitive dissonance of its own could fill books and chapters and encyclopedias that, you know, David would have to then dig through to understand stuff. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Another a quick example, this ain't even quick, but um, I'm on now the Georgia Obamacare, you know? Yeah. And it's a $300 plan and it doesn't include a month, a yearly checkup, like a female, we, we get these things called pap smears and it doesn't include that. So, you want me to not get checked up. You want me to not have birth control, but then you also don't want me to have an abortion. So right. which which one is it? Because yeah. we need health care and I need to be able to go to the doctor to get educated about ways to avoid pregnancy. But you don't you don't want nothing. So you don't want me to have health care or abortions or anything. And we don't want to teach it to you in high school. You want to teach me? You don't want to teach right. me sex ed? Yeah. And, and there's some really interesting study done studies done of politicians who are the most pro-life and most like man and woman. Those are the ones who often end up cheating on their wives and often end up doing it in like, you know, male, 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 female type situations and then end up having the abortions. And you're just like, what? Like and I had a professor. 
who would literally just study those. He's like, the people who do it the most are always on some back end, like just so repressed about it that they're yeah. pushing this out here. It's like, those are the ones that you need to be worried about. Yeah, Thanks. like Mike Pence with conversion yep. therapy. Why are you thinking about dick so much that you- So much. <laughs> you said, we got it. We got to convert. <laughs> we got to go to a camp. There what must be some man. What straight man is that? I said we gotta we gotta stop thinking about these dicks. <laughs> That's right? what we gotta guys? do. We have to organize so we don't do this no more. <laughs> we gotta <laughs> stop this, y'all. We gotta, we gotta stop, stop this. this. Yeah. That was no straight man ever. <laughs> Start a camp. <laughs> oh. oh, this is yeah. This is gonna be interesting. I think you know. So what? What? Let's do takeaways of all of these problems that exist. What is your goal for the podcast? I think my goal is to keep a humorous level of engagement so that we know, number one, Raphael Warnock has two years. His term is up in two years and he has to run again. Yes. And that is exactly where we lost Obama, was two years into his term. We, we got complacent and we let these Tea Party people take over and they took over. And so that's the big thing. We need to keep this Senate and um, the House in two years for the midterm election. So that is my goal, just to be lightweight and funny, but also, y'all, we got to stay engaged. Keep Georgia blue. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, man, I think I'm trying to be a part of a podcast that I wish I would have knew about 10, 15 years ago. Like where there's information that could keep me engaged, keep me understand, make it digestible, make it so that, you know, like I could tell my little cousin about this like yo you should yeah. listen to this you know and along with everything you're already you know consuming check this out too because i i do think that there are too many decisions being made and people not knowing who's making it why they're making it what their motives are like any of that and like i'm that person right so like my goal is to when we get people on is to ask the questions that i know that my friends would ask if they ever were to be so blessed to be able to ask these questions to people who might have the answers. Cause I do, I do feel there's a crate, there's a, just a wide, just a heavy disconnect of people who understand what's going on and people who have to live with what's going on. And uh, I, I don't, I think that is by design. And so my, my job is to, to uh, dismantle that design yeah. in, in my own way, you know? Yeah. No, I love that. And I think, look for us, for, you know, the listeners out there, our goal is to bring on, representatives, federal judges, council members, commissioners on a weekly, bi-weekly basis and just break it down and understand in normal talk what it is that they do, how that impacts us, right? And, and not only promoting accessibility of individuals who want to run, but accessibility to our representatives and our politicians, encouraging engagement and turning this momentum into action. So our goal is every week, or every podcast, we're going to leave you with an action item as well. Something that's super simple. We're going to spoon feed it to you, make it as easy as possible for you to do and really empower you to take back this control. David, earlier when we were talking about this, you said, you know, our legislators, our legislation, our bills, our representatives are just that ours. And it yeah. has been taken yeah. away from us, right? It has been taken away from us. Yeah. And we just got to figure, figure out how to bring it back. Yeah, I would like to add to mine. I would like to inspire somebody to run for something. I hope one day somebody says, you know, how like you hear comedians orange stories and they'd be like, I saw this bum comedian talking about this and I, was, I could do that. So I just want to like <laughs> demystify all of this and somewhere there's somebody that's like, that's all they do? Let me let me get involved. That's it. That's and, you it. know, somebody with a pure heart is like, that's it? Look, well, sure, let, me, let, me, let me get some flyers together. If let Marjorie get Taylor Greene can do it. There you go. Yeah. Anybody. Yeah. Like get we, involved. I think we need comedians, at least in our state representative. We've got to have some comedians in our state legislature. George Wallace said they keep that. talking about this. I'm like, do y'all really know us? We got to. No. We got to. No. We got to get artists Not. in there. We got to get healthcare workers in there. Yes. We got to get people who are just normal in there. That's the no, problem. We're we not normal. Consultants. We could be consultants. <laughs> yes. We could we could punch up a speech. That's it. I'm there you go. For that. There you, you know, go. The comms team. I'm I'm happy for a comedian to be the press secretary. We yeah. <laughs> All of that. But we shouldn't be making no real yeah. decisions. No. But I think look, I show think, up on time. So. No, I think that's the problem, right? Like, I, I think these decisions are things that impact all of us. And, and when I say normal, I think the abnormalness is what's normal. 
right? And I think, and then you end up with these people who are supposedly perfect and live these ridiculous lives to end up there because of all of this bullshit that goes on, right? And I think we need what I see as normal, right? In in the state house, right? And in the state legislation and in the national, like I, I, I'm, I'm, we're gonna start the comedians for Congress hashtag and we're gonna find someone who's gonna run. I just wanna bring back like the funny politician that like, he not, he don't know they funny, but they saying that stuff. <laughs> Like Obama, like, Obama wish he was a comic. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The closest to a comedian, like somebody that would have tried comedy if mm-hmm. politics wasn't more important. Right. That's who needs to run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They we, the people who have dedicated their lives to comedy, don't need to run. They don't need y'all, me. Y'all no can, more David Perdue's on no ballots. Y'all, y'all can write your speeches. For the vote. <laughs> on. Yeah. Y'all can write their speeches. Uh, yeah. w- there you go. <laughs> We also wanted to take a moment in in the spirit of social justice, recognizing the history of the indigenous people whose lands we, you know, all are occupying and acknowledging that we're speaking from their ancestral lands of Cherokee and Muscogee tribes in Atlanta. You know, we we talk a lot about politics and representations, but the reality is that we're all doing this, like the core seed that has been planted has been planted on bloodshed, right? Has been planted on the lands of indigenous people who are barely represented at all in local, state, national politics. And I think it's important that we really understand, you know, where you start from is really important. And, and we definitely haven't started from the right perspective as, as a country, as a democracy, as the United States. And I think it's important for us to at least acknowledge that and, and continue to push and, and uplift those voices as well. <laughs> he was like 1619 project. I need a 1492 project. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Let's we gotta be go real. Back. We got to go back. Trash. That's a 1492 project. <laughs> All men are created equal. Yeah, we murdered a bunch yeah. of them. Yeah. 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 Not, not them <laughs> though. <laughs> and, and you know what the in, here's the interesting thing about that as well. In the tribal nations, typically women were the leader, leaders. And part yes. of the problem that we had is the white man was like, oh, let me go talk to a man who wasn't the leader. And that caused a lot of internal issues as well within the tribes. And they said that there were so many more mass murders because it was men talking to other men and not actually talking to the tribal women leaders who they should have been speaking to. That's I pro- bet that happened in Africa too. White people been bifurcating by for fornicating. There you go. fornicating. That's hey, what happened in Africa. Up. They went to the men and they would like sell us some of your people. And, and the, the wife was like, huh? What y'all talk about? Oh, yeah, nothing, baby. Nothing. What? Man, now yeah. we in there slavery. We yep, just like that. Now we yeah. both in slavery. Now we both. We, <laughs> just that? Need, we just need more women leaders. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I, there's so many situations that I've seen where it's like somebody did something. They'd be like, oh. Such and such mama died a couple of years ago. I'm like, oh, you ain't you ain't had no Nobody mama. Was there. Like, mm. your, your mama didn't tell you to sit your narrow ass yeah. down. Trump, yeah. your mother, you have mommy issues. You can tell when people yes. Yes. have Absolutely. issues with their mama. And, or just and the, women. I don't listen, yeah. I make it. I have a in my brain, when there are too many, I don't care if they're my friends. If it's too many of us in one place, like what we this nothing productive can come from 10 of us just being around here coming up with plans. <laughs> Like yeah. even this podcast, initially yep. it was me and Veneer, the full disclosure. And I was like, I don't trust myself with another man to talk about stuff. That That's what he said. Important. Yeah. I don't. I was like, we got to bring on Joy Ellen. I was we like, you were, yep, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and, and our commitment is most of our guests, I'm looking at the guest list of people who've committed so far. I would say probably 70% of our guests are people of color, um, you know, be black people of color. Um, and then most of them are also women. I mean, the women, you have to listen to us. We have a black female mayor. A black woman just took over John Lewis's seat. We got Kamala. We got Stacey Abrams. Yeah. Y'all going to learn yep. to listen to us. Yeah, thanks. We're you going to start our own Wakanda <laughs> and niggas ain't going to be invited. <laughs> Bro, listen, I don't have my homegirls tell me about how women talk about going in the mountains. I was like, don't forget me. Where y'all go? Look, it's got to be a job. They're like, look, y'all messing up. You, you man is out here. And I'm like, look, when y'all decide to move, I'm not saying I ain't trying to take over. I will you I will kill a spider. I'll do something. I'll do stuff you, you don't want to carry do. the heavy stuff. I will do it. Just don't leave go. me with these men. Cause That's I know it. what's gonna happen. We're gonna blow some stuff up that didn't have no business being blown up. Oh, <laughs> I have a hundred percent. You know, like some of those wildfires in in California were started from like a gender reveal party. 
Yeah. And one of my friends was like, I'm pretty sure that was the husband's idea to say, we're having a boy, let's explode something. <laughs> <laughs> let's yeah. blow something up. Blow that was some never a woman's idea. No. Not with no fire, no pyrotechnics. <laughs> it's, it's a boy. Yeah. Yeah. I want my son's first experience to be a bang. Not a whole California on fire. Jazz. Imagine living with that, though. Like, you grow up and you're like, yeah, two truths and a lie. Like that, you know, is going to come out. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Confused Caucus, the black, brown, and blue. You can connect with us on all major social media platforms at Confused Caucus. Please be sure to like, share, and follow. You can also listen to us wherever you find your podcast. Please subscribe to get all the latest episodes and don't forget to leave us a review. We would like to thank our team, Ashila Giovanni, Ali Punjani, Chandan Hebal, Lexi Jenkins, Mira Sito, Nathan Owens, and Shaquille Hudda for all their help with this episode, and Shamir Giovanni and DJ Anis Lee for providing the music for our show. For more information on how to get involved and to keep up with our episodes, please visit our website, confusedcaucus.com.